mention the term scientific photography and most of us will think of things such as forensics and medicine, pictures of the crime scene or the progress of someone's illness. But there is a lot more to scientific photography than meets the eye. What's more, like many technical professions, modern technology is rapidly transforming the conventional notions of scientific photography. These advances have taken place hand in hand with an ever-increasing demand in scientific circles to find new ways of exploring the world. In fact, new ways of seeing altogether. Originally, um, scientific photographers, medical photographers started out just like any other commercial photographer. They were applying straight photographic skills to a scientific discipline. Gradually, they've learned to adapt technologies, use new technologies, hybrid systems to try and produce images that are meaningful in science. The pace of change has been dramatic in the last, say, decade, and particularly in the last few years. New imaging systems, electronic imaging and so on, are causing dramatic change in the way people use imaging modalities in science. inception, scientific photography has increasingly involved the use of special processes and equipment, which are often far from conventional. These days, the processes and equipment used in scientific photography have been transformed to such an extent that photography, in its purest sense, may soon become obsolete. In some cases, a still camera and film may not even be needed at all. For example, a video camera could be used to record the information instead, and then it could be analysed later on a TV monitor or a computer. One of the biggest changes has been the notion away from what we recognise as conventional silver-based film into digital technologies whether they actually be truly digital, and that is capturing a pixel by pixel image into a computer, or whether they're actually analog electronic images, that is what we recognize as video, and indeed the hybrids between the two. 20 years ago, 10 years ago, uh, the scientific photographer's tools were generally cameras, lenses, and film. Uh, today, it's uh, computers, it's video, uh, it's uh, non-traditional light sources, and. CCD chips that are sensitive in uh, the areas of the spectrum that uh, are outside of the visible range. If I was setting up a department like this again, I wouldn't have to use conventional dark rooms and conventional cameras. I might go all digital because it's possible that way and you can save an awful lot of money by not having to rely on dark rooms and so forth. Um, but having said that, the traditional methods still are useful and um, computers can be seen as a tool in their right place. There's a gradual transition in technology. Film-based technology still has some incredible strengths. Uh, we can get silver emulsions that are sensitive in very low light levels. They actually have enormous storage capacity in terms of information compared to the digital domain. But the digital techniques, charge couple devices, video cameras, video capture boards and computers, all have real strengths in the way that you can actually work with the data to manipulate it, analyse it, get useful information out in terms of either visualisation or measurement. Film will be around for many years. Um, there is still a lot of research and development in traditional film materials. There is great debate and, and controversy over whether uh, the recording capability of film versus electronic imaging is, is uh, equal or one is better uh, than the other. What's happening is that scientific photographers are changing. They're becoming what I call imaging scientists uh, and in a way they're, they're adapting. And I think that silver-based technology and what I choose to call silicon-based technology, the digital domain, run side by side quite effectively and uh, most profitably in the scientific arena.
scientific photographers can be found in the public and private sectors, serving both commercial and community interests. Mostly, they tend to work in a particular field of science. So you will find, for instance, that many large metropolitan hospitals have their own photography units, and the same is true of departments such as police and forensics. Scientific photography is used in a wide range of fields, and with the advent of new technology, its role is expanding. Scientific photography is, is a very broad term, uh, of course. It can range from uh, you know, documentation of, of, a, of a crime scene uh, to shooting uh, astronomical photographs and analyzing uh, colors of stars. For example, specific applications would be in forensic science where uh, photography is used to reveal the hidden truth to a jury. In medicine, it's used to both directly uh, help a patient to diagnose their condition and also to, to train successive generations of healthcare workers. In engineering, uh, photography is used in manufacturing technology, in aiding the process of manufacturing, uh, so it has applications in a wide range of things. There are many specialised techniques that are used in this process, things like photomicrography, uh, photomacrography, Schlerian photography, uh, photogrammetry, the use of invisible radiation, infrared and ultraviolet. Broadly speaking, there are four main purposes for scientific photography. To document, to measure, to reveal, to communicate. It should be remembered that these four purposes are not exclusive of each other. There will almost always be an overlap. They're not exclusive at all. It's quite possible that you take a picture, for example, of um, a patient with an ulcer in hospital. Now, that picture may well have been taken to measure the, the extent of that ulcer. It's also a record, though, and as the patient's treatment progresses, it will be used as a from recording. Um, it may also then be used to communicate effectively. You might use that picture in teaching to teach uh, young nurses about treating ulcers and so on. So pictures often wander between those four categories, although they have a primary purpose. An image which documents the subject should depict it as accurately and objectively as possible. Often it is intended to provide a permanent record of the subject and in many cases is used to furnish evidence. It is particularly useful for transient or perishable subjects or where it would be impractical to retain or demonstrate the evidence at a later date. One of the, the major areas of uh, scientific photography is in uh, documenting, documenting things that um, sometimes are, are difficult to show to other, other people because of their location, their size. We document uh, transient uh, material. Uh, this is very popular in the, in the forensic science area where a piece of material may not exist for a long time, so we have to get an accurate image, an accurate record of that. What we've got here is an elderly individual who's been injured and the problem we've got to solve is whether these injuries relate specifically to a uh, possible assault or whether they may re result from an accident. Mm. Um, and in order to do that, we need to document the position of the injuries and the injury types. Um, so you want an overall, perhaps? Something over this Yes, area? initially we need Documenting some the injuries on a body is an example of teamwork between the photographer who takes the pictures and the pathologist who directs what pictures are to be taken and what particular injuries need to be documented. So if we could have a close-up of that, perhaps, with or without the scale, and then we'll just document the other injuries in turn. All right. You can't take a body into a courtroom and um, have the jury looking at the particular injuries many months or even years after the person's been killed. So it's important to get a good record of the injuries and the pattern of injuries so that at a later stage you can go and demonstrate exactly what was wrong with the body in the courtroom. 
the documentary aspect of scientific photography is important and is critical because we have to, as scientific photographers, show this in a fair and accurate way, uh, not adding any of our personal bias or adding any additional uh, optical problems, optical aberrations, changes in perspective. If a patient comes and visits a, a doctor at month one, then that um, doctor can have a photograph taken of um, the particular condition and have a look at it 12 months down the track to see if the treatment, how the treatment's going. And not only is that beneficial for the doctor to, to keep a track of how it's going and not having to rely on memory, but can, it can also help the patient see how well the treatment has helped as well. An image which measures the subject is meant to ascertain the extent or quantity of something. In some ways, the image will be a document as well, since it provides a record of the measurement taken. We can measure a number of factors about events in science. Uh, we can measure how long something takes to occur very easily, the time base of something. We can measure physical dimensions. Uh, we can use photogrammetry to assess volume, surface area. Uh, what extent of a mountain is covered by trees. We can indeed very accurately measure uh, distances through photographs, uh, through uh, single photographs, although it's a little more difficult, or through methods like stereo photogrammetry. Uh, the terminology photogrammetry simply means measurements through photography. So I have to come this way and take a seat, please. I'll just position your head now for the camera. Right. Well, there's a number of different techniques in photogrammetry. Each particular photogrammetry method will produce a contour map by some means or another, like in geography. Try to take a deep breath for me. And from that contour map, you can then plot what's happening with um, rises and bumps over the skin and work out the, um, the volume, the surface area and so forth from that contour map. In this example, where we've used broadcast video equipment to look at the trajectory of flares. Once we've acquired the video, we can bring the, the, the tape back to the laboratory and then import it into an image analyzer. In the image analyzer, we can then subsequently take measurements from the video, uh, which allow us to uh, measure those parameters, the height, the ejection velocity, the distance that they might travel. When photographs are to be used for measurement, it's really important that the scientific photographer understands the accuracy required. That's going to affect a whole range of things, the technique that's used and therefore the time cost factors associated with the measuring process. OK, so we want the picture of the knee showing the injury at the front of the knee. Um, we'll have that with the scale so we can see the exact size of the injury. Mm -hmm. We use photography uh, in the autopsy room. Um, we use it to actually assist in measuring injuries, uh, and we'll be able to, um, by analyzing the photograph, measure back and compare later on, perhaps, an injury on, a, on the skin surface of the body with, um, let us say, part of a weapon that might have caused that injury. which reveals the subject is one which either shows details not visible with the naked eye or which the eye may not readily discern. Uh, the techniques of scientific photography are very appropriate to reveal those things that, that we with our senses cannot see. Uh, it may be a situation in time, the, the flapping of a hummingbird's wing. We can't visualize that except through uh, photographic means. Photography can be used uh, in a whole range of ways to expand or compress different spectrums. It would be the spectrum of size, for instance. There are some objects that are just too big for us to study appropriately, and photography can compress them. There are some things that are too small, so we use a microscope to expand them. Similarly, in terms of the real spectrum, uh, the wavelength of light that we use, we can move out away from the visible spectrum into other imaging technology. We might uh, look at uh, flowers and think, that they may be a, a lovely yellow color, and, and yet under ultraviolet radiation we may see uh, dark lines that, that come up that um, are visible to the insects who need to find 
uh, food in the middle of this flower, yet we don't see those things. We've built a camera here which actually uses an infrared array detector. It means that we can now take pictures of things like the Orion Nebula where young stars are getting born inside dense clouds of dust. With ordinary optical work, you can't see in there, but with the infrared uh, camera, we can actually see deep inside the cloud and see the young stars getting born and that kind of thing. An image which communicates the subject is one which facilitates the exchange of information from one person or group to another. In science, effective communication is vital because it enables information transfer from researchers to end users. Often the end user may not have been involved in the imaging process, but needs to be informed about the final results of the work. Forensic pathology and forensic science involves recording events, analyzing events, and presenting those events to a court. Indeed, that's what forensic actually means. It relates to the Roman Forum or the, Rome, or the court place. Um, so therefore, forensic pathology is involved in presenting information to the court, which means you have to communicate uh, effectively um, details of what's happened to people uh, in the courtroom. Now, one of the major ways in which you can do that is by using photographic evidence. This is a close-up photograph I took of the shotgun used by the offender. Photograph 35 is a close-up photograph that I took of the wound caused by the shotgun that the offender had used, and it clearly shows the impression of the shotgun on the body. Excuse me, Senior, your definition of clarity and mine obviously come from different dictionaries. Could you be more specific, please? Well, photograph 103 shows the wound after it's been cleaned by the pathologist, and it clearly shows the wound caused by the shotgun and the sight of the shotgun. As we all know, there's an exponential growth of knowledge in science. The ability to communicate effectively from one scientist yeah, to another, one really doctor to well, another, is extremely um, important. Photography plays a fundamental role in that, that process. Uh, at conferences almost every day of the year around the world, scientists tell one another about the outcomes of their experiments. They do that through photography. And if you look at the photograph on page 28, Getting a clear brief is as crucial to the scientific photographer as it is to any type of photographer. This is especially the case in non-routine situations where the photographer may have been called in to photograph an unfamiliar subject. Whilst it would be true to say that most scientific photographers apply their photography to routine tasks, many work as independent investigators. When you're doing this, it's very important that you obtain a proper brief from your client and you understand fully the purpose of your recording and your, your measurement. In most cases, the, the photographer is dealing with a, uh, a scientist, a, a researcher, an individual who is not a photographer and do not understand exactly the principles of, of photography. They have in their mind a vision of what they want, but the photographer has to interpret that into reality, into something that can be put on film or in a video camera or digitized into an, an electronic device. Understanding the domain that your client works in is equally important. You have to understand the language. Uh, it's like working in a foreign country. Uh, if you don't understand the language of pathology or engineering or physical science, you'll find it very difficult to communicate with your client and truly understand what it is they want to show. Our problem is that the pilot in this side of the aircraft cannot see fully the marker on the other side of the aircraft to oh. cross-check the, the instrument readings. Oh, OK. Well, if we take a look at the one of the cockpit here, what we really need is perhaps two shots, uh, one from the co-pilot and one from the pilot, to show the true perspective of what they see. Yes. With the right choice of lenses, we'll show their field of view from either side. That's, that's good. That's good. When a client comes to me with a problem, um, I like to okay, so really actually, question them wide. exactly what that problem that is. Now. And then okay. they may not see that uh, photographically I can solve that problem for them because uh, being in science, they're probably not aware of some of the um, techniques that scientific photographers can achieve.
Like any scientist, scientific photographers must also ensure their work abides by certain procedures and protocols. For example, in medical photography, there are standard procedures for lighting and photographing the human face. Can you look towards the lens for me here? We now need a three-quarter view, so if you can actually turn towards the light here on the corner. The protocol is a systematic way of approaching a particular photographic project. Possibly it will be critical to know the time of day, the type of film, the type of camera, the distance away uh, from the object, how it's processed, who's handling the material afterwards. These may be very crucial and critical questions that could come up uh, at a later date. In medical photography, I'd say that the um, most common technique, if you like to call it that, is standard patient photography. And that means that the, um, the lighting, the background, the film, the color, everything has to remain exactly the same, the magnification, so that you can compare something at a later date. And the only thing that it will have changed is the patient's condition. It's also extremely important in the courtroom, uh, where uh, it's uh, very possible that uh, different photographers work in different ways, and that if they don't work in a very standardized fashion, you don't know where the variables have crept in. There is a wide range of specialized techniques and equipment which the scientific photographer must be familiar with. Whilst it is true that the conventional film camera and darkroom still play an important role in scientific photography, scientific photographers are also expected to be able to operate equipment such as digital cameras linked directly to computer workstations. The photographer must understand the principles on which the equipment operates and how it will help him or her to satisfy their client's requirements. The scientific photographer should also have a detailed knowledge of processes and materials. These range from coloured filters to special purpose films and developers. The type of film selected and the way it is treated during processing can be varied to yield effective results. Uh, knowledge of film stocks is very important. You need to know spectral sensitivities of each film and how to use a particular film that you want to, to gain a, a given result. Also using filtration for that film. So you need to know, understand how the filters work in, in conjunction with those films. In some respects, the sorts hey, of concerns scientific photographers have are the same as those which we use when we take our own photos. For instance, getting the exposure and the focus right. However, the scientific photographer's skills extend far beyond these. Usually, we want our photo to look good, to be pleasing to the eye, or to have sentimental appeal. But the scientific photographer is less concerned with these sorts of considerations. Aesthetics are clearly important in, say, commercial photography. They have a much lower priority in scientific photography, where the main emphasis is on information content. Is the data there? Is the information there? Although, of course, aesthetics are important. If you have failed to compose a shot effectively, then you fail to communicate the data. In scientific photography, we have to show a lot of things purely for documentation, whether it's pretty uh, or not. But one should never let go of the idea that uh, a picture that is, is pleasing, aesthetically pleasing, uh, may make more of an impact than one that's not. One of the ironic legacies of scientific photography is that many of the images now end up decorating walls and being published in art journals. Whilst we know that the scientific photographer doesn't usually set out to produce a work of beauty, it seems that many images are characterized by precisely that. If, for example, if you think of a microscope, that it, it reveals a hidden world that the naked eye could not access, and 
and the world that it reveals is, um, has a certain pattern and form, whether it's a, a crystal growing or um, a, a microscopic uh, animal or, or, or plant. Um, that, that revelation can be um, very poetic. It opens a poetic world view to people. The truth is that photography is rarely all science and rarely all art. What else could you be but incredibly optimistic? I mean, photography has given our culture so much. It has given us personally so, so much. Um, how can it, you know, it's, in, it's inconceivable to think that it, yeah, it's not going to be equally rich or resplendent in the future. Yes, I'm very optimistic about the future of photography because I think it has a long way to travel. Uh, at the moment, I think it's probably in a, a state of um, anxiety about itself. The introduction of computer technology, digital technology, has meant that people are perhaps uh, reinventing the wheel a little bit. But the movement, say, into installation and the use of photography in a much more activated way means that uh, there are photographers out there who are beginning to explore the medium in dimensional ways that we could never have anticipated, you know, at the turn of last century. I think now in the 90s, uh, photographic students are very aware of, of the, the, the more recent uh, concerns with uh, postmodernist uh, issues, deconstructions. But I think what seems to be the thing now is that students will push the boundaries of uh, the traditional photographic medium. I see a bright future for photographers uh, and of all areas, commercial, fine art, scientific. We, we communicate well with images. People are responsive to images. Photography fascinates me because it's got such an intriguing role in our society. We can't imagine life without it. But at the same time, it's a fabulous craft. If you can have a craft of an industrialized society, photography is it. I'm extremely optimistic about the future of photography. We photograph every aspect of the human condition, from before we're born to after we die. There are 60 billion frames of photographic film recorded every year in the world. There's no doubt that although there are technological changes coming along that push the agenda around, that photography will remain a fundamental part of our society for decades to come. That was the final episode of Photography. Next Wednesday morning at 4.30, we commence the open learning child development series, Time to Grow. Coming up, French in Action. like information about studying through open learning, phone 0055 11770. 0055 11770.